This is a really special time of the year uh, in our church and in church uh, as a whole. It, re- it reminds me of Timmy. Uh, one morning he was uh, sleeping, Sunday morning, and his mom comes in and says, wake up, Timmy, it's time to get ready for church. And Timmy looks to his mom and says, I'm not going. And mom looks at him and says, you hush your mouth, boy. You are going to church. Timmy says, no, I'm not, and I've got two reasons why. They don't like me, and I don't like them. (laughs) So Timmy's mom looks to him and says, well, I understand, son, life is hard, but you are going to church, and I've got two reasons why. You're 45 years old, and you're the pastor. Uh, I'm so grateful to be in a church that I actually love being in. Really grateful uh, to be here. We're in a series. Uh, This is our third week of a series that I've entitled Chase the Light. And it's all about the light of God that has come to us through Jesus Christ. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at the gospel, which is to say the, the core message of Christianity but not just with an eye on the death of Jesus, because the gospel is not just Jesus' death, it's his whole life, death, and resurrection. And so we're looking at the gospel, but through, in particular, the light of the incarnation. The incarnation is just a theological word, which means God coming into man through the person, Jesus Christ. And it's all about the message, the good news message that God comes to offer humanity. You know, some of you guys probably know my sister, Holly, uh, much older. You can tell her I said that. Uh, Two years older. (laughs) But my sister and I, of course, we grew up. uh, My parents had two kids. We all grew up in the same house. And my sister and I, we both had a room, of course. And so here's the thing, though. My room was right next. It was uh, connected to the bathroom. And hers was not. And so as we got a little bit older, my sister became a teenage girl who spent literally all day in the bathroom. Uh, She wanted to switch rooms. And I didn't have any problems with that, except that I knew that that's what she wanted. So I was adamantly opposed. I believe this was the first time I ever used the phrase, over my dead body. Not going to happen, Holly. So my parents were in a bit of a predicament then. They had to figure out what they were going to do here. And they decided that the right thing to do, because Holly was a a teenage girl, was to switch rooms and give her the room that was near the bathroom. So that was going to be good news for my sister and bad news, in a way, for me. Uh, So they're trying to think, well, how are we going to break the bad news to David? Let me tell you how they did it. And they know what's coming. So that summer, I went to summer camp. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you see, oh, you see where this is going. Okay. So I go for a week. I come back, walk in the house. I'm back. Walk into my room, flip on the light, throw my backpack towards the direction that my bed used to be only to discover in horror that my parents switched the rooms when I was at camp. And so um, I wasn't thrilled with the message, but I couldn't help but respect the way the message was given. I just thought that was awesome. I look forward to doing that kind of thing with my daughter someday. (laughs) That story serves uh, in stark contrast to the way that God would come and deliver his good news message uh, to us, of course, when God wants to come and tell us the good news, he doesn't do it in an email, he doesn't do it on a blog post or in a newsletter, uh, he doesn't come and stealthily br- deliver the news while you're at camp. No, <laughs> God, when he comes to deliver the good news message to you, he comes in person, in the person Jesus Christ. And so we're talking about the gospel. What is the gospel? And we've said that the gospel in one word is Jesus, right? Jesus is both the uh, source and goal in the Christian faith. All of our life, all of our discipleship is centered around being disciples of Jesus Christ. And the message 
he, he's, he's not just the messenger, he's also the message, right? So the, the gospel is the good news, not of an event, but of a person, the person, Jesus Christ. And so it's not just his death, but it's his whole life. In fact, uh, when, we, when we look in the New Testament, that's the second half of the Bible, we, we see that the New Testament begins with four books, and we call them Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The reason that we call them Gospels is because they tell us the story of Jesus. And so the Gospel of Mark, which is the shortest book and likely the first written, look how it begins. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 1 it says this. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So here you can see that Mark just comes out and says what it is, that, that the good news message is not about an event, but it's about a person, his entire life. And then Mark says something really interesting or says what Jesus says that's really interesting in Mark chapter 14. This is the, the Passion Week, if you're familiar with that. That's when Jesus is walking towards his death. It's the week leading up to his death. And he's in Bethany, and he goes to um, Simon the leper's house, and of course, a famous interaction there. The, the lady comes and, and breaks open the bottle of expensive perfume, and in an act of lavish generosity, pours it over Jesus' head. And the, the uh, religious people, of course, hate this. They think it's wasteful. And Jesus says, leave her alone. She is anointing me for my burial. And then look at what he says uh, in verse 9. He says this, Truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. That's an amazing statement. Here Jesus is saying that this woman is part of the gospel. That what she did by pouring the perfume on his head, that's that's included in the gospel. And so if you just think of the gospel as, you know, God's really mad, but if through Jesus, if you accept Jesus, maybe God the Father will chill out. It makes no sense that that, that would be part of that story. But if you understand the gospel correctly, which is the whole life and ministry of Jesus, then it makes perfect sense that this lady would be a part of the gospel because it's part of her, his story. So the gospel in one word, Jesus. But if you were to expand it a little bit, and that's what we've been doing in this series, we might say something like this. The gospel is the good news of Jesus who has come to, and then four things, four weeks in the series. Show us God's love, save us from sin, bring us peace, and unite us with God. So this is the third week. So what we're going to talk about is Jesus who has come to bring us peace. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I'm just going to read a, a quick verse in Isaiah chapter uh, 9, and then you can actually earmark if you would like to. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 is where we'll go here in a minute. But Isaiah chapter 9 is your very familiar Christmas texts, uh, and it's a prophecy given by the prophet named Isaiah. And look at what Isaiah says in verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. So who do you think he's talking about here? Well, of course, we would say Jesus, but if we were to ask maybe our non-Messianic Jewish friends, they might say, uh, potentially, Hezekiah. And Hezekiah was a good king, for Israel, got, them, got the nation of Israel back on track uh, with God. But we believe it's talking about Jesus and not Hezekiah. Um, and the reason is that the, the prophecy, the language of the prophecy goes beyond human. And it starts talking about someone who is clearly God. And I would say to say these things about just a normal man gets right up to the line of blasphemy. In fact, possibly even crosses uh, over that. But um, so we believe as Christians that it's talking about Jesus. And of course, it's a, it's a prophecy that was spoken hundreds of years before Jesus would come, uh, pointing towards Jesus. And we can see in retrospect that it's talking about Jesus. And that's oftentimes how prophecy works, that, that oftentimes it's, it's hard to perceive prophecy going forward. Right? If, if there's a prophecy that's going to be something that happens in the future, sometimes it just sounds a bit like gobbledygook and it's hard to really understand. But it, it plants a seed of understanding to where when those things begin to happen, you're able to look back and say, ah, yes, this is what that prophet was talking about. 
So here Isaiah is talking about Jesus, and he says this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Listen to this. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called, and then he lists four names. And the first name and the last name, the first and the fourth, could possibly be talking about a human, but the second and the third, absolutely no way. This is the list about this son that's coming. First off, wonderful counselor. So he's the one who's going to give us counsel. We're going to come to him and he will grant us wisdom. And then we also have mighty God. Wait, so this boy that's coming will also be the mighty God. Number three, this boy will be the everlasting father? Wait, the everlasting father? I thought we were talking about Jesus. You can't call Jesus the everlasting father, can you? What's that about? Well, you got to remember that Jesus says that when you have seen me, you have seen the father. So Jesus is not the father, but Jesus is the only perfect picture that we have of the father. And when we get to know Jesus, we're getting to know the heart of God. And then lastly, number four is this, and this is what I'm wanting to kind of target on this morning, the prince of peace, prince of peace. And so you might be thinking, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, this word peace uh, is beautiful Hebrew word. Perhaps you've heard it, Shalom. Maybe you've been even greeted by that phrase, right? Shalom. Maybe a, a Jewish friend would come to you and greet you with that phrase, shalom. And in the Bible, the word shalom is usually translated peace, but it, it's a lot more than that. It's this big phrase that, that has so much deep meaning. It's love and joy and peace and health and vitality and long life and unity amongst the community, right? So, so that's all in peace. You might say it something like this. Shalom is what love looks like in the flesh, the embodiment of love in the context of a broken creation. Shalom is a hint of what was, what should be, and what will one day be again. Where sin disintegrates and isolates, shalom brings together and restores. And you can see that the peace that God comes to offer us, it's, I like to say it's bi-directional. What, what, what does that even mean? It means two directions. It's pointing two directions. That, of course, what God comes to offer us is peace with God. But part of the shalom that God brings is not just peace with God. It's also peace with each other. And that's really what's required to have true peace. Let's think about, think about an earthly kingdom called, can't think of anything. I don't know. Think, think of some, it's some kingdom. It's centered around a king. And so if this kingdom were to have um, an abundant life, if it was to flourish, well, what would be required for a, a kingdom? Well, of course, it would be required uh, to have peace between the people and the king. But also required would be peace with, b- between the people. And if you didn't have one, the other one would collapse as well. Right, so if you don't have peace with the king, you're not going to have peace with each other. And if you don't have peace with each other, you're not going to have peace with the king. That's something to how we understand the shalom that God comes to offer us, the peace of God that's peace with him, but it's also peace with each other. So briefly, I'm just going to talk about peace with God and then go to my larger point, which is peace with each other. First off, peace with God, you have to understand, peace with God is not something that we earn And it's not something that we achieve. The the peace of God is something that we receive as a free gift. In fact, look at what Paul says in uh, the book of Colossians. He says this, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you. Pay attention to that phrase. You were enemies in your minds. You were enemies in in your mind. Some of you may need to rethink God because in your mind, he's your enemy. But not in his mind. Right? It, it, I, uh, I have a daughter. My daughter is Grace. As you know, she's two. And she doesn't hit a lot, but she does hit some. 
I've been told that's normal, so I'm comforted by that. Uh, so sometimes when Grace gets really upset, she'll resort to hitting. In particular, she'll hit mommy and daddy, right? And so because we said she couldn't do something or she has to do something that she didn't want to do, every once in a while she will resort to hitting. Um, and so, so she thinks that mommy and daddy are her problem when we're not really her problem. And I think that that's somewhat similar to how people's relationship is with God. Some people, I know people, I have friends that rage against God. But God is never your problem. Maybe in your mind, he might be an enemy to you in your mind, but never in his mind. God is never the problem, but he's always the solution. That has everything to do with who he is and how you understand um, his character. We, we talk about at this church that love is God's DNA. It's his essence. It's who God is at the deepest level is love. And so nothing that God ever does is in any way incompatible with love. And so that ought to be an encouragement to you that you just understand that God's uh, doesn't mean that life always plays fair. It rarely does. But God is never the problem. And God is always working to bring about love and peace and joy and shalom to you. Uh, so, so for me, like I can love you, but that doesn't mean that I am love. But, but God is different. At the core of who he is, is love. Um, so if we were to go, let's say, to a fellow theist, you know what I mean by that? A fellow theist, someone else who believes in God, but is not necessarily a Christian. So if we were to go to a fellow theist and say, do you agree with this statement? God is love. Well, almost every theist, some other religion or no religion at all, but just believes in God, almost every theist, people who believe in God, would agree with that statement, that God is love. They would agree with that. Um, there's something in the human heart that, that it just it feels like God should be love, or we want him to be love, or he ought to be love. But only the Christian has evidence that that's true, right? Everybody wants God to be loved, but only the Christian, because of Jesus, has evidence that that's true. And so that all comes from uh, the incarnation. Peace with God and peace with each other. Ephesians chapter two, verse uh, two. A, a few scriptures. This is uh, Paul writing to the church of Ephesus. And he says this, chapter two, verse 14. For he himself is our peace. Notice, notice that he doesn't say he brings us peace or he makes peace possible or he facilitates peace. No, it says that Jesus himself is our peace. For he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one. So what do you think he's, what do you think he's talking about there? Two groups one. Well, in this particular case, he's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles, right? But the, the Jewish people and the non-Jewish people. But you, it, can, it can be any, any group that has been separated through race, nationality, gender. It's God's heart. God wants to bring unity where there has been division. Verse 14, again, for he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed, listen to this, the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Beautiful phrase. He's destroyed the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. See, so in this case, he broke down the religious rules that were keep, keeping people apart. His purpose, why would he do such a thing? Why would he break down the barriers? His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making what? Peace, shalom. Because, because, of, because of Jesus, the lines of division that would separate us have been um, rendered utterly unimportant, right? Be, because of Christ now, in Christ, there's, there's just one nation, right? There's one nationality. It's the kingdom of God. Now, because of Jesus, there's, there's one race, the human race, so loved by God. In God's kingdom, there's just one family, right? The family of God. We're, bro we're brothers and sisters. 
And then in verse 16, and in one body, talking about what Jesus did, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. It's beautiful. That, that he killed their hostility on the cross. Usually when we think of what was killed on the cross, what would we say? My Jesus, right? But, but Paul here is saying that one of the things that was killed on the cross was our hostility towards each other. And then beautiful in verse 17, he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. See, so whether you're near God or whether you're far from God, the message is the same. Peace with God, peace with each other. Verse 18, for, though, for through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. So it's, it's the same spirit that is motivating both of us. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers. It's like a stranger, I don't even know you. We're no longer strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. It's interesting here that here, here we see it's a kingdom concept, is that we are, we are citizens in God's kingdom, and at the same time, we're members of God's family at the same time. So he uses, he uses national imagery and he uses family imagery. So we're all brothers and sisters. Um, so for you, uh, today, Jew and Gentile is not likely going to be something that you encounter day to day, not in our context, as a dividing wall. You know, you go to work at Walmart and the Jews are a part, you know what I mean? Like that's not something that we are likely to encounter in modern day, in our particular context. Maybe you do, but that, that's not the most common. But that doesn't mean that there are still warring factions within the body of Christ that are working very hard to build up dividing walls, right? Maybe it's a, a racial wall, or it's a theological wall, or it's based on um, gender right, that, that we work so hard as Christians to build back up the dividing walls that Jesus himself came to tear down. There's a huge theme in scripture, which is unity amongst believers. You, you can't hardly get a page in the New Testament without them talking about the importance of unity amongst believers. In fact, Paul, he, he, he writes well, almost two-thirds of the books of the New Testament, and he uh, does not go through a single book without talking about the unity that we enjoy as believers together. Just a, a quick tour through a few of his letters. I've got them on the screen. Uh, Paul says this, to the church in Rome, he says, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. To the church in Corinth, he says this, We are members of one body, and one part of his body can't say to another, We don't need you. To the church in Galatia, he says this, There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, not male, not female. To the church in Ephesus, he says this, maintain the spirit of unity and the bond of peace. To the church in Philippi, he says this, be of the same mind, having the same love. To the church in Colossae, he says this, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. To the church in Thessalonica, he says this, be at peace among yourselves and work to build up each other. To his protege, the young Timothy, he says this, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies on Facebook. <laughs> I may have added on Facebook. If he wrote it in 2019, I think he would have said on Facebook. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. That's so good. Because they bring contentiousness and quarrels. To Titus, he says this, avoid quarreling, but be gentle and show courtesy to who? All people. So here's a question. All of these churches, did, did these churches have differences between each other? Absolutely. 
Do they have people in those churches that have different ways of seeing the world? Absolutely. Did, did all of these churches have more, um, some more progressive people and some more conservative people? Certainly. Right? But, but the gospel comes and tells us that despite our differences, we have unity through and because of Jesus Christ. And if that feels foreign to you, just know that it's because it's so different than the way of the world. The way of the world is what? Competition. Right? Where I need to be better than you. This is, this is Cain being jealous of his brother Abel because God accepted his sacrifice. This is the, the older brother in the parable of the prodigal son, jealous of his father's lavish love towards his younger brother. This is, um, this is my company versus your company. This is there's only one spot, and we're both going for the job. So we're competing uh, with each other. It's like the teeter-totter. You guys familiar with the teeter-totter? Remember that from uh, when you were a kid? It seems like a dangerous uh, game, Bam, hit you right on the head. But of course, you both get on the teeter-totter. And if you push someone down to the ground, where do you go? Up, 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 up. Right? But now if someone else, they start to rise, where do you go? Down. So in order for me to go up, that other person has to go down. Now that is not the way of Jesus. Jesus has um, another way where in the kingdom of God, competition is replaced with unity, brotherhood between each other. So uh, we are not the only church in Albuquerque. Have you noticed that? Perhaps you noticed 49 churches as you drove to church today. There are literally hundreds of churches in the city of Albuquerque. And we all have our own little theological nuances and um, ways of seeing God and ourselves and each other where we believe we're right and they believe they're right. And so we have little differences. And at the same time, you know, there's only a, there's a certain amount of church attenders in the city of Albuquerque. That is bound to change by the second, but, just, but it, there is a number, right? There, there's a certain number of people who came to church today, a certain number. And so it makes sense if you think about it like the world, that if there was a church that were to um, find themselves in trouble and have to shut their doors, go out of business, so to speak, that that would be a good thing for the other churches, right? That's if the church was like the world, but the church is not like the world, we, we don't play by those rules, right? And so, so, so we understand that despite our differences, what we have in common is so much greater. So that's why we, we see and we say to Sagebrush Church and to Citizen Church and to Calvary Church and to Legacy Church and to New Life City Church and North Church and Hope Church and New Creation Church that we bless you, right? We love you. We, we pray and believe that God would bless your ministry, right? You, you are not our enemy, Right, you are our brothers and sisters, and we declare that God is going to bring about blessing to you. And you might be thinking, how do you say that, Pastor David? Aren't they the competition? Nope. No, they're, they're our brothers. They're our teammates. You, you, know who, you, know who the, you know who the competition is? You know who the competition is? The devil. Like we're, we're not trying to steal people from some other church. We're trying to steal people from the devil. Right? Yeah, it's true. And so so what's, the, what's the principle at play there? The principle at play is this, unity despite diversity. We may have very different ways of understanding things like creation, uh, the end, end times, understanding the Trinity. We've got lots of different opinions on lots of different things, how we ought to ba baptize people, how we ought to receive communion. 
right? How we ought to do marriages, how we ought to do funerals. There's lots of differences in all of those different areas, but we believe that what we have in common as followers of Jesus Christ absolutely trumps what we have in the way of differences, right? So um, if you would allow me to do just a, a brief minute of real talk, uh, I believe, um, yeah, I've got uh, something to say. 2016, uh, or four years ago, leading up to the 2016 election, I felt like I was starting to see um, in, not in our church necessarily, but in the global church, something that I thought was happening that really, that really troubled me, that really grieved me, and I thought people maybe in the church weren't noticing what I was noticing. And what I felt like I was noticing and that what God was showing me was that we had become so um, motivated by our political convictions that it was beginning to erode the unity that we were supposed to be enjoying as a family. That, 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 and this is both sides. That, that we were in a place where people weren't even wanting to be in the same room as someone who had a different opinion on Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders. And it's just so insane to me that we would, that we, that we would get confused on what it is that makes us family. Right? That, that I don't need you to think the same as, that's not what makes me family. That's not what makes me family to Carol or to Jordan or to Pastor Cindy or to Pastor Marshall. That's not what makes me family, that we agree on everything. We don't agree on everything, but we're family despite our differences. I just think we, we need to um, regain what I have entitled these last few years, the ministry of cool. Okay? <laughs> And by that, I don't mean, you know, that we all have to start wearing skinny jeans and long t-shirts and scarves. I'm not saying that. But the ministry of cool as in, um, uh, cool as in unrattled. You know what I mean? And while the rest of the world is losing their mind, stabbing each other on the internet, right, that we as the body of Christ would be people who could actually bring peace to a situation. And in order to do that, you can't be the one that's always jumping into the controversy. Sorry, I know it's fun. But you lose your ability to influence if you're always the one jumping to point out how different you are from those other people. Do we have differences? Absolutely. Doesn't mean you can't be part of a tribe, but what you can't do is start building up walls between us and those people, in particular when those people are also part of your spiritual family. You just can't do it. So I, th- I think the ministry of cool is, um, I, I don't need to be the person who's right. I'm going to be the person who's sane. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not going to jump in and start wounding because I realize that more important, is that, is that a crazy idea? More important than what you think politically is your unity with your brothers and sisters. That's more important. If what you value the most is your kingship to the king or that your citizenship to the kingdom of God. If that's the most important thing, then you protect that. And so with, with that comes just a... a a willingness to sit in a room and listen to someone and fellowship with someone who may have very different ways of seeing the world than you do. But we believe that what we have in common through Christ Jesus is so much greater than what we have in the way of differences. So whenever I talk about brotherhood and being a peacemaker uh, in communities, oftentimes people will come up to me and they'll say something kind of like this. Pastor David, that's, that's a cool... That's a cool idea. Here's my question. What do you do, or how are you a peacemaker towards people that are just naturally combative? I can't be the only person who's ever met someone like that. They're just happier when people are fighting. And so, so, uh, because of course, just because you want to be at peace doesn't mean they want to be at peace. So how are you supposed to um, handle yourself there? Well, I believe the solution to that is in Hebrews chapter four. It's a verse that we read Last week, I want to read one more time. Beautiful scripture. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, 
But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. It's an amazing scripture here that, that says that, that Jesus didn't just empathize with us, but he empathizes in particular with our weaknesses, right? He didn't sin. He made better choices than we do. But he, he, because he was human, he, he, he understands the pull that we feel, even when we make terrible decisions, even when we, when we know the right thing to do uh, and instead we do the wrong thing, that Jesus is able to empathize with us in our weakness, saying, I know what that feels like. Doesn't mean he sinned. He did not sin. He made better choices, but he was tempted just like we were tempted. And so I think about, I think about that and I think about my um, apprenticeship to Jesus. And as somebody who, uh, in every way that I can, have submitted my life to Jesus, to saying, Jesus, you get, you get all the votes in my life. Like, I, just tell me all the things, places that I'm wrong, and I will do my best to change them. I want to be more like you. Uh, that's not works. That's just because I love Jesus. And so, so I'm trying to do that, and I'm, I'm learning that for me, maybe... Maybe you feel the same way. For me, I, I feel like God is, needs to do some work in me in the area of being able to empathize with people even when I think they're wrong. Right? Doesn't mean I don't call sin a sin. But even when I do call a sin a sin, I'm able to empathize and say, I understand that pull. I understand that feeling uh, that you're feeling. I was thinking about that. And uh, I thought of this story that was years ago. Uh, me and my buddy Luke, we s had an apartment together in uh, Colorado Springs because we were both going to Bible college. So we were both going to the same college and we had an apartment together on the third floor steps. Uh, and attached to this apartment complex, there was a little laundromat. And so the, the laundromat, you know, we would go down, so we're... We didn't have a washer and dryer, so we would go down and do our laundry. Well, one day when we went down there, we both had got off work. It was probably like 11 p.m., bachelors. So we were down there. Uh, we walked down there to do our laundry. Usually there was no one at the laundromat that time of night, but in this particular case, there was one um, older lady sitting there waiting for her laundry to uh, dry. Uh, from this point on, we will refer to her as Mrs. Grumpy Pants. So me and Luke, we go in uh, to, to do our laundry. And, you know, they have these little shopping carts, right, for, for the carts that you can put, put your laundry basket in, you know, just to make it a little um, easier. And so we grabbed one of those and went to the machines and started our laundry up. And I don't know if you know this, but waiting for laundry is like waiting for paint to dry. It's the most boring thing you've ever... And so, so we're, just, we're just little... We're just kids. And, oh... Here at the laundromat, there was a sign that said essentially this. Do not allow children to sit in laundry carts. Do not allow children to sit in laundry carts. Now, I'm not much of a letter of the law kind of person, but for me, when I read this, I think children not allowed to play in the carts, but adults, it's A-OK. -okay. <laughs> So we're bored out of our minds, we're 20. So I hop in one of these carts. These are heavy duty metal carts. I'm not hurting the cart. I hop in the cart and uh, I proceed to have Luke drive me around the laundromat <laughs> while I'm like barking out these um, boating orders that I don't, uh, you know, mast over, you know, st stem to stern. I don't even know what I'm talking about. And so Miss Grumpy Pants, she looks at us and she says, get out of that cart, read the sign. And I'm thinking, you need to read the sign. It says children, I'm a 200 pound man with a beard. So I, so I go and I hop out of the cart and we're just, you know, putting our change in. And what do you think I'm doing? replaying the situation, thinking of all kinds of clever comebacks. Don't tell me you have never done that. So I'm thinking like, read the sign. You need to learn how to read, period. 
or, you know, just because, just because we're not as ancient as you doesn't mean we're children. I was just thinking through all this stuff, you know. Like, God, that would be good. God, that would have been great. Oh, I should have said this. And then when I, I was sitting there, I was, I was thinking, and I, I thought about, of all things for a Bible college student, I thought about Jesus. Right? And I, I thought about what he might have me do. What, what would he do in that situation? And what might he have me do in that situation? And then I thought in particularly about this scripture, how he empathizes with our weaknesses. Right? And, and I began to think about this lady. Right? And I think thinking about her life. You know, she's probably in her 60s, and she's at this piece of junk laundromat attached to this piece of junk apartment, 65 years old, 11 p.m., doing her laundry. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking there's no scenario where this lady, when she was our age, was imagining that she would be right here in her 60s. There's no, there's no possible way. And so I started thinking about her life, and I started thinking about what was going on with her. Um, and I started thinking, well, you know what, maybe, maybe this is her one time a week where she can get a little bit of peace and quiet, where she can relax, because people aren't usually there that late. So maybe she can just relax and find some sanity in her life. And then here come these two punk kids that are disrupting the whole situation, you know. And I, um, I was just thinking about it, and I, I thought two things. Um, the first one is I... I'm not changing my mind on whether or not she was right. I think she was wrong. I, th I think she was wrong in the way that she read the sign, and I, was think she, I think she was wrong to care that much in the first place. Right? But, but with that said, I, 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 f I begin to feel for her and feel with her. It, it, it wasn't about agreement it was about me being able to empathize with somebody else, even if they had a different way of seeing the world. And by, by the end of that, I just had one thing to say to the lady, and that was, I'm sorry. And so, so as we walked out, I went to the lady and I said, I just want to apologize. You know, we, we were disruptive and we didn't think about um, how that would make you feel. So I, I hope you forgive us. Again, we're sorry. And she said, well, read the sign next time. <laughs> and I wanted to be like, you need glasses. <laughs> but I just said, I will, I will. And again, we're sorry. Merry Christmas. I think it was around Christmas. Um, and, I, and as I was walking back to my apartment, I was just so glad. I, I was just thinking, thank you, Jesus, that strife is not going to be the final word here. Because think about how differently that could have turned out, right? Like, um, I, I could have just sat there and continued to stew and then done what too many of us do, which is I probably could have started texting my friends. You'll never guess what Miss Grumpy Pants did. I'm over here, oh my gosh, she doesn't even blah, blah. And then I'd probably get some more ammo from my friends. And, oh, you're poor, poor me. And I would just feel super righteous. But because I was able to empathize with someone, it wasn't about me agreeing with her. I did not agree with her. It was about me being able to enter into her life story, strengths, weaknesses, and all, and um, see the world the way that she saw it. And what's great about that is that's not dependent on someone else. That's a, that, you can do that independently of their response. And even if you get a bad response, read the sign, even if you get that, you still have the ability to be a peacemaker in this situation by entering into someone else's experience and empathizing with them. Here's my closing thought. Who is the person that is your enemy right now? And follow-up question, what do I need to change in my thinking and my actions to become a peacemaker towards them? Who is the person that is your enemy right now? And what do I need to do to change, what do I need to change in my own thinking and my actions to become a peacemaker towards them? Maybe for some of you, that would be reconciling with someone who you believe wronged you, but they don't think that, right? So in this particular case, that's gonna be you forgiving them even though they're not gonna apologize. And that happens. <laughs> and yes, you still have to forgive them. 
I mean, for, some, for some of you, it's, it's inviting Jesus back into your thinking. And when you're having all these conversations with these people, oh, and I should have said this, and they said this, that maybe in those conversations, you would also give Jesus a voice and you would invite him in to those inner dialogues and see what he has to say.